بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome back to another production, another video from Rod Shubhat. And in continuing with our series, as you see on the screen, we are dealing with part number five of our series, the 15 biggest lies of David Wood, exposed and refuted. So we're dealing with point number five, and we hope that for those who are new, they would be interested in catching up uh, to part number five by viewing the previous four videos that we have on our channel. Uh, quickly, I'll show you what those videos are and, and the, the agenda laid out. You can see here the 15 biggest lies that they will be refuted and exposed from 1 to 15. So if you have missed any of the past, um, then we hope that you would um, catch yourself up and stay tuned for the remainder of this series um, in which we deal with these lies and expose and refute David Wood uh, thoroughly once and for all. Now, um, we're going to get to his section, his video, in which he's dealing, um, him and Sam Shimon, with the issue of Zainab bin Josh and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Zaid. So let us get right into that. We want to try to make this video as succinct as possible, but at the same time as thorough as possible as we try to always do and close this argument once and for all, inshallah. Let us listen to him in his argument and then uh, as we always do, we'll play uh, his um, take on it. we refute it um, point by point and then in conclusion, we'll bring the clarification and also at the end, as we do as well, we're going to bring from the Bible itself a case in point in which this example that they're using actually is to their disadvantage and against them uh, rather than against Islam. So let us listen to them. Let us get right into this. And inshallah, let us refute them. Bismillah. Muhammad married the divorced wife of his own adopted son. And yeah. you might say, well, kind of weird, but how would that show he's not a prophet? What do you think, Sam? Well, according to... Okay, quickly. So in this series that they're doing, top 10 reasons Muhammad is not a prophet. So they're trying to use this argument against the prophet Muhammad, which they fabricate the argument in the first place, but they use it to try to justify the fact that the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, could not be a prophet because of this action. As I mentioned, we're going to look into the Bible and show the hypocrisy and the standards that they always use against the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. Why don't they use those same standards against characters in their own book to come to the same conclusion? They can't because they need to expose themselves. But since they don't do it, we're going to expose them and show you how hypocritical and disingenuous these guys are and that they're not interested in the truth whatsoever. Rather, they're just inter, inter, interested in a smear campaign against Islam and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Let us listen in and let us watch just how um, just how foolish these guys are, and we're going to expose them for that. Chapter thirty-three, verse thirty-seven, and chapter thirty-three, verse five. The Quran, thirty-three, thirty-seven, thirty-three, verse five. Muhammad was told by Allah not to be ashamed of the fact that he's going to marry the divorcee of his adopted son, because Muhammad is going to set precedence. His example of marrying his adopted son's divorcee would then give permission, license to other people to do the same in case they had adopted sons who also divorced women. But here's the problem. That was chapter 33, verse 37. Here's the problem. Shortly after that passage was sent down from Allah to condone what Muhammad did, <clears throat> Muhammad adopt, uh, abolished adoption altogether. Because according okay, so now what he does here is that he... he flips the verses in the order of the revelation to make his case and this is all he can do because if he does it the correct way then his case is, is, is futile so we're going to examine these verses as dealt with one is in Surah 33 5 and one is in the same Surah 33 37 he mentions 37 the verse 37 is being revealed first and then later on verse 5 was revealed first but this is incorrect in the order of Revelation, as the chapter goes, as it proceeds, verse 5 is there, and verse 5 was revealed first. And then later on, verse 37 was revealed about the Prophet Muhammad wasalam, and Zainab and Zaid in particular. So by him mixing it, he's trying to do this to confuse the case and make his point, um, make his point to be um, something strong, but it's not the case. So let us listen to him 
And then let us bring these verses to see how the verses went in the order in which they revealed, and then expose them for his lies. According to the tradition, Muhammad had adopted a son named Zayd. Zayd ibn Muhammad, he was called up to that time, who divorced Zainab and Muhammad married Zainab. Well, when people started making fun of Muhammad, started mocking him, saying, look, he took his son's wife. So guess what Muhammad did in chapter 33, verse 5? Stop calling your adopted sons your sons because they are not your sons. Let me read the verse. Call them adopted sons by the names of their fathers. That is more just with Allah. But if you know not their father's names, call them your brothers in faith, right? You are your freed slaves. There is no sin on you if you make a mistake therein, except in regard to what your hearts liberally intend. And Allah is ever forgiving and most merciful. Now, this verse is the verse that came first. This verse you're reading is verse 5. And let us go to verse 5 and see exactly what it says so we can see it for ourselves. You can see it for ourselves and then we can make it our own assessment from it. But here is a verse... That's being addressed. Verse 5 is here. And it actually starts at verse 4. So it would be in our interest to read that as well because it's a context. Allah is not just addressing this idea of adoption, but He's also addressing other pagan pre Islamic uh, superstitions that the people had at that time. So for him to leave that out, again, also uh, shows just how disingenuous uh, these guys are. So let us go to verse 4, and let us read the context and then continue. It says, to translation, Allah has not made for a man two hearts in his interior. And this is, as some ulama have mentioned, that this is about trying to please Allah, at the same time trying to appease or please um, human beings. If Allah sends a matter down, then that matter is what it is. And if it upsets or pleases human beings, then we have no regards in that. Our intention and focus is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And your heart can be trying to please Allah at the same time trying to please other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is what this is referring to. And then Allah says, the translation, And he has not made your wives whom you declare unlawful your mothers. So this was a superstition that was called vihar, that the, the Arabs made, that when they got upset at their wives, they said, you, or the back of you is like my mother's, meaning it's haram for me to approach you. It's a way of them uh, showing this pleasure with their wives and saying, you're forbidden for me, the same way my mother is forbidden for me. So Allah is addressing this issue, which was a superstition at that time, and something that Islam came to prohibit, because your wives can never be like your mother's. And also, Allah addressed the idea of adoption because your sons can never be like your real sons. So this, uh, this situation is not isolated. It's not something that's by itself. Allah is addressing these issues to clear off um, the scene from any pre-Islamic pagan superstitions that existed. And this was one of the issues that was dealt with. And he says that he has, made not, he has not made your adopted sons your true sons. This is merely your saying by your mouths. But Allah says the truth and He guides to the right way. And it's interesting, even the name for adopted sons in, in Arabic is Ad'iyah. akum. And this word comes from a claim. It means to make a claim. So they're your claim ch children. They're not your real biological children. They are your children that you claim to be yours. And Allah is saying, it's a claim you make with your mouths, but the reality is not true. They are not your real children, so don't call them your real children. And Allah says, Allah says the truth, and He guides to the right way. The next verse, number five. Call them by the names of their fathers. It is more just in the sight of Allah. But if you do not know their fathers' names, then they are still your brothers in religion and those entrusted to you. And there is no blame upon you for that in which you have erred, but only for what your hearts intended. And never is Allah forgiving and merciful. So whatever occurred in the past, whatever people done in the past in this matter, then it's not held against you. And it will be done no more in the future because the prohibition of this matter has been revealed. So this is the backdrop. This is what this case is. Now, this applied to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Zayd, and it also applied to anyone else who had the same situation. But this verse is not being sent down or revealed, quote-unquote, because all of a sudden, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam needs support for action he done. 
this verse came first, and now the adoption uh, has been, or calling your children, these, these adopted children, your name other than their father's name, has been prohibited by revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now let us go to verse 33 and see what it says. Then let us listen to him finish his case, and then let us refute them and expose them. 37 rather, let us go to 37. The verse, it says, And remember, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when you said to the one whom Allah bestow, whom Allah bestow favor, and you bestow favor. This is talking about Zaid, the adopted son of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Keep your wife and fear Allah, while you conceal within yourself that which Allah is to disclose. This verse is very, very important, as we're going to bring this to, to close this case once and for all, and to show what this is about. Um... In opposition to the other uh, story that's so familiar, uh, narrated on the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu While you conceal within yourself that which Allah is to disclose, and you fear the people, remember the verse five saying that Allah has not made in, in, in one person two hearts. So don't worry about what the people will say. Be concerned about what Allah subhanahu wa taala has said. While Allah has more right that you fear Him. So when Zaid had no longer any need for his wife. Or for her, meaning when, when the, the divorce came to be, we married her to you. Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala married her to you. The Prophet ordered that there not be upon the believers any discomfort concerning the wives of their adopted sons when they no longer have need of them. So whatever was present at that time and whoever found themselves in such a situation then they didn't need to feel any difficulty in themselves from proceeding with if they wanted to marry the ex-wives of their claim adopted children. But there would be this case no longer because adoption had already been prohibited. But whatever we may at that time, then this verse made it permissible um, for those to uh, take this action and not have any uh, constraints about it in themselves. And ever is the command of Allah accomplished. So this is now the verse directly dealing with the marriage of uh, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, to Zainab after the divorce of Zaid from Zainab. Let us listen to him. Let us return back to this verse and then let us look at it and then look at some points as it relates to this whole situation and then we are close. And 3340 was also sent down saying, Muhammad is not the father of any of your men, but he is the messenger of Allah and the seal of the prophet. So notice what's going on here, David. 3340 came after 37. So again, it's making it clear that, you know, this is, this is what's the reality of the matter now. But don't, don't mix the verses in their, in their sequence to try to make an argument that you yourself want to promote. These guys are notorious for lying, and they, they can only accomplish their agenda by lying. And this is all they have to offer, is lies. So let us listen to him. Let us be done with him so we can finish and make our case and close this. He marries Zayd's divorced wife, Zainab, who happened to be Muhammad's first cousin, to set precedence for other... Another point, which happens to be Muhammad's first cousin. So, again, the Prophet Muhammad, as we're going to contrast this to the story that's circulated about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and touching this briefly uh, to make this matter clear but this is something or someone that was not foreign to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam knew Zainab from her, from her birth he was her cousin and he's older than her so he, he, he watched her grow uh, and she was no, no novelty to him so this is important and I'm glad he mentioned that it came from his own tongue so which it helps you know, uh, refute his own self adoptive fathers, right, to do the same in cases of their adopted children, divorce their wives. But then after that, he abolishes adoption in order to save face because people kept mocking him. Look, you claim to be a prophet and you married your adopted son's wife. So where did he get this from? Where did he get this from that he, he now he came with this verse to, um, to protect himself from the, from, from the mockery and the criticism from his people? Where did he get this verse that 37 came first and then all of a sudden, Another verse, verse 5, came after to um, support him. 
He don't bring anything to support this. This is his own concoction, and this is what we mean that when people, um, when 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 they bring such uh, half truths, then they they bring they do so in trying to give an impression about something that's false. The verses is there, but the arrangement in which he's bringing the verses is not the case. So his argument, you know, what I'm saying is from 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 the beginning, his argument is futile. But this is what these people do. They're liars and that's what they are. This is all they can do. They can lie. How dare you? What prophet would do that? So now how does this... What prophet would do that? Would, would do, do what? We're going to see from the Bible what a prophet would do. That even if his argument was, was, was true, the argument from the Bible of what prophet would do is worse than what he's bringing right now against the prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We're denying his, 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 his statements here. But if for argument's sake, even if we took his statements and said, okay, this actually happened according to how we say it, his question of what prophet would do that, he had to answer that same question about a prophet in his own book that he holds to be high regards and that has direct connection to his theological uh, foundation of his own faith. And we're going to bring that in the end. But this is, again, I mean, we have to, we ha we have to see how these people lie and have no shame in lying. To set precedence when he abolished adoption shortly after that. Ado uh, adoption was abolished before that, not shortly after that. And the uh, adoption is, was abolished is naming or calling these children as if they are your children. This is what's prohibited. To name them with your names as if somehow this is your real child. They're not your real child. This is, this is a claim you're making. So we're going to read a very strong comment uh, that clarifies this matter uh, by uh, a great scholar, uh, Maulana uh, Maududi, and we're going to see what he brings on this uh, shortly. Let him finish this point here so we can get rid of them and then make our cases and expose them and, and proceed. So there, you have multiple problems with this, uh, yes. but it, this does follow a general pattern of Muhammad receiving revelations that have no purpose whatsoever other than justifying some uh, yeah. practice that would have been really seriously frowned upon by the people around him. He, he would have been regarded as doing something horribly inappropriate, marrying the divorced wife of his own adopted son after he caused the divorce and then justifying it with a verse that makes no sense because the reason Allah wants him to do it, why? Because uh, you have to uh, you have to understand it's okay to marry the divorced wives, your own adopted sons, but now I'm getting rid of adoption, so this will never apply ever again. So you can see just a twisting. And then David would say something here. He said something that a divorce that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, caused in the first place. How did the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam cause the divorce of Zayd and, and Zainab? How was that? He's hinting to the story that circulated about the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam um, and which we want to bring um, and touch on it, but we don't want to spend much time on it because it's off what we want to deal with. But we're going to bring it um, for information purposes so you can see where it comes from and you understand where we're going with it. But this lie of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, causing divorce in the first place only to then abolish adoption, which there was no need for the verse of justifying his marriage to Zainab. Uh, again, they're reversing the order of the verses to make their case, uh, and this is a lie. So their argument, again, uh, falls on its face from the very beginning. Yeah. It's just, I mean, it's absolutely yeah. silly and ridiculous, and this happens over and over again in the Muslim sources. So this is just... This happens over and over again. It was a very beautiful uh, hadith from Aisha. She mentions about if there was any verse that the Prophet Muhammad wasalam, would have wanted to try to hide... This would have been a verse. But the Prophet Muhammad SAW was not able to hide anything from the Quran because he's a messenger of Allah and he's receiving revelation and is commanded to re uh, recite this revelation to the people. Uh, but if the Prophet was trying to hide something or embarrass uh, some type of a, a embarrassment from himself, then why do we even have this revelation in the Quran? There's a principle or criteria of embarrassment that the Christians often use to justify their own scriptures. So let's look at this whole criteria or principle of embarrassment for the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu If he supposedly is the author of the Quran, as you claim, 
why would he bring verses in the Quran that will seemingly go against something of himself and make him look bad? If that was the case. But because he's a messenger of Allah and he's a true messenger and he's one that's revealing the message that's given to him and he's trustworthy in doing so, then we find everything in it even when Allah reprimands the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, about certain things and teach him about certain matters. So this is further proof. This is further proof of the truthfulness of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, yet while we see these, these charlatans and these clowns lying on uh, the sources of Islam and it's um, it's source text. I mean, how obvious could it be that this does not come from God? Okay, so how obvious could it be that this does not come from God? And this is um, one of his closing remarks here. So I want us to remember all of his statements and keep that in mind when we bring our conclusion in uh, the end about the verses of the Bible that we're going to expose them on. Okay, so there you have their story, and that's it. Now, a couple of things we want to bring out. Let us first go to some backdrop and hist history about this verse. We want to read a st statement from um, the tafsir of uh, Maulana Maududi. On this topic, social reform, he brings this narration. This is dealing with verse 33. We're going to go here. It says, In this connection, an important thing that needed to be reformed was the question of the adoption of a son. Whoever was adopted by the Arabs as a son was regarded as one of their own offspring. He got share in inheritance. He was treated like a real son and a real brother by the adopted mother and adopted sister. He could not marry the daughter of his adopted father and his widow after his death. And the same was the case if the adopted son died or divorced a wife. The adopted father regarded the woman as his real daughter-in-law. This custom clashed in every detail with the laws of marriage and divorce and inheritance enjoined by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Baqarah and Nisa. Surah 2 and Surah 4. It made a person who could get uh, no share in inheritance entitled to it at the expense of those who were really entitled to it. It prohibited marriage between the men and the women who could, contact, who could contract marriage perfectly lawfully. And above all, it helped spread the immoralities which the Islamic law wanted to eradicate. For a real mother and a real sister and a real daughter cannot be like the adopted mother and the adopted sister and the adopted daughter. However, one may try to sanctify the adopted relations as a custom. When the artificial relations endued with customary sanctity are allowed to mix, let's go back. When the artificial relations endued with customary sanctities are allowed to mix freely like the, like the real relations, it cannot but produce evil results. This is why the Islamic law of marriage and divorce, the law of inheritance, and the law of the prohibition of adultery require that the concept and customs of regarding the adopted son as the real son should be eradicated completely. And I mean, this, this, this is a beautiful explanation of what's happening here. The, the, the Quran is dealing with um, cultural norms at that time that was antithetical to the Islamic principles. So this is how this matter came to be concluded. And this is what it is. Now, let us look at some points here carefully before we go back to the story and examine it. And then also the story uh, in which is often mentioned in relation to this. They mentioned standards of prophethood in the beginning of their video. We're going to look at these standards to see that these standards of prophethood actually meet up with what they have in their own books for their own prophets. Also, the injunction that he mentioned uh, about this for future cases uh, did not have any application because it, it will only apply to cases where people at that time were married, um, adopted children were married, and then when they divorced. But this never took place thereafter, so there's no need for um, there's no need to have this something that will be taking place in the future. Also, we mentioned about Vihar, which was a case that Allah also mentioned about the women 
um, being called like their mothers. So this is another practice at that time that the Quran came to address and do away with. What was Zainab's relation to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? What was her status? And how did these matters relate to the marriage with Zayd and the divorce? The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as we mentioned, was the cousin of Zainab. And he knew her from her youth. So she was not something, uh, or she was not someone that he knew all of a sudden after the divorce of Zayd and Zainab. Rather, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam married Zayd to Zainab and insisted that the marriage take place even though initially, even though initially the divorce or the marriage rather between the two was something the family of Zainab did not prefer. Why? Because Zainab was from a higher class and Zayd was from a lower class as being uh, a former slave. But again, in trying to eradicate these social uh, norms that existed that went against Islam, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu insisted that we take someone from a higher class and a lower class and show society that Islam is bringing people together on the basis and the premise of sincerity and the righteousness before God, not on class, um, not on class base. So this is very important also to understand the backdrop of what's going on as it relates to that. Um, Zainab's initial desire in the beginning was even before the marriage to Zayd was that she wanted to marry the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is something that she knew about herself uh, and this was later uh, made known in later time. But this was uh, something again that wasn't new to them because Zainab knew the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam knew Zainab. So when we look at these situations, we find that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, didn't do anything wrong whatsoever in this matter. He didn't do anything wrong whatsoever in this matter. Now, this verse we want to look at here, 37 and chapter 33, because it's very important in refuting another argument that's brought up against the Prophet Muhammad Sassam as it relates to this story. Allah says in the translation, And remember, O Muhammad, when you said to the one whom Allah bestowed favor, meaning Zayd, and also whom you bestowed favor, meaning the Prophet Muhammad bestowed favor on Zayd, by freeing him uh, when he was a slave, and then he took him as an adop adopted son. He told Zayd, Keep your wife and fear Allah. Because Zayd came to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and told him that he was having problems with Zainab, uh, it was very difficult. Uh, she said some things that uh, was very difficult for him to handle. Um, she was kind of not for the marriage in the first place, but they did it um, at the behest of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and tried to work it out. It didn't work out. Marriage happens, divorce happens. Um, but nonetheless, they tried to go through with it, and they did their best, and it ended up in a divorce. We say, MashaAllah. Nonetheless, Zayd came to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he told him that he wanted to divorce Zainab. This was before anything ever happened, anyone knew anything. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told Zayd to fear Allah and keep your wife. But at this time, information about the, 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 the marriage of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to Zainab was made known to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah had made it known that Zayd would divorce his wife and that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or that Allah Subhanahu Wa would marry Zainab to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But because of this social norm that existed at that time, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam felt a, a constriction or a, a difficulty in his heart knowing that this was the case when he knew the social norm and his social uh, superstition that surrounded uh, such a marriage. But Allah told the Prophet Muhammad says something, you conceal within yourself that which Allah is to disclose. What was it that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa concealed in his heart that Allah was disclosed? It was his news of knowing that he would be married to Zainab. And at this verse, and at this point, this is the direct source and proof of refutation against the lie that circulated up about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu that he seen Zainab in some compromised clothing and lusted after her and wanted his and wanted to marry her 
And this is the reason why this whole uh, divorce took place between Zayd and Zainab. Um, this is a, a story that initiated with someone who was untrustworthy in their narrations in Islam. And it became popular as time went on. But this story, even from this little part of the verse, is refuted because Allah says, While you concealed within yourself that which Allah is to disclose. What was it that Allah was to disclose? It was the knowledge that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, would end up marrying uh, Zainab bin Jash. Not that he had some lust or desire for Zainab. When as we mentioned, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, knew Zainab a long time before even covering themselves, before the revelation came, before his um, prophetic mission. He knew who Zainab was and there was never no lust or intention or desire uh, to marry her at that time. So, um, you know, these are fabricated um, stories that are circulated uh, in, in the Muslim sources. And they're mentioned and mentioned sometimes, seven times over. But nonetheless, we know that their source um, is not reliable. And from this verse alone, and from this one sentence in this verse, clearly makes it, uh, makes it known what the reality of that matter was. So, we marry her to you in order that there be not upon the believers any discomfort. So Allah married Zainab to the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and Allah was her wali and this revelation served as a marriage contract for them and there was nothing else needed other than that. And the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, actually sent Zayd to Zainab to mention to her about uh, him, um, meaning the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, taking her in marriage. So this is, in, in, in just this story, there's nothing that was done wrong by Prophet Muhammad um, the, 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 the ayats for adoption came down, it prohibited. Then Allah mentioned the story about what happened with Zayd and Zainab and the Prophet Muhammad as we're reading in, in verse 37 of 33. Khalas, the story is over. There's nothing else to see here as uh, trying to make a case where it's not there. This is what happened. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala seen fit to bring this institution of adoption to an end amongst the people and also the permissibility of marrying the ex-wives of your adopted children. That's the end of the story. Is there anything else to see and say about this story other than someone having a personal problem with it or from their own culture they're trying to judge and uh, evaluate the story? No, uh, that was it. So now, I want to look at something in closing that is a problem, and it's a very serious problem, um, and no one uh, can have any doubt about seeing this as being a problem. It's a bit lengthy, and we're going to close with this, inshallah. This is a story in 2 Samuel in the Bible about David and Bathsheba. Now, in the beginning of their video, they mentioned that this event with the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is being used to discredit the prophethood of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. How, he, how could he be a prophet and doing something like this? Well, we know quite clearly David is mentioned as a prophet in the Bible. David is mentioned as a prophet in the Bible. So I want to take this criteria that David Wood and Sam Shimon use against the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, who legally and lawfully married a woman after a legal and lawful divorce between his claimed adopted son. A legal and lawful marriage after a legal and lawful divorce from his adopted son. This is the premise by which they say the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him has been disqualified as being a prophet. Yet, according to the Bible, David is a prophet. And according to Islam, we believe also David is a prophet. And also, according to Islam, this story that we're about to read, we do not believe it's true. We do not accept this story as being truthful, truthfully narrated about David, alayhi salam, peace be upon him. We don't, as Muslims, we don't accept it. But it's in their books. We consider this to be part of the folklore that has crept into their books that they mention as nice uh, stories to tell around campfire or something like that. Um, but we don't believe this to be truthful uh, about the, the great prophet David Dawood alayhi salam. 
But let us read and conclude, and let us present this argument to the Christians, and to David Wood and Sam Shimon, and let them deal with this, and tell us if this story, according to their book, is enough to disqualify David as a prophet, who, according to their own theology, is the king who Jesus is descended from, and is sitting on the throne of David. Jesus is supposed to be the Messiah that's coming to rule and sit on the throne of David. Yet, David, according to their own book, has engaged in such a despicable act that we're going to read right now. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. Interesting, he seen a woman bathing. Her name is Bathsheba. <laughs> uh, just something uh, humorous uh, that I thought to mention. Uh, the woman was very beautiful. And David sent someone to find out about her. Can you see the sensationalism here? Can you see the story, the drama was happening here? And this is taken now and trying to be reflected or deflected on the Prophet Muhammad um, in their own minds. But nonetheless, the woman was very beautiful and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of uh, Eliam and the wife of Uriah, the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him and he slept with her. Now she was purifying herself. From her monthly uncleanness. Then she went back home. The woman conceived. And sent word to David saying. I am pregnant. Can you believe this? This woman who's married. And David sees her bathing herself. Cleaning herself from her monthly menses. Sends for her. Has sex with her. And she becomes pregnant. It goes on. So David sent his word to Joab. Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent him to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was, how the soldiers were, and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, Go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace, and a gift from the king was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all his messengers, servants, and did not go down to his house. So he sent him to his house and telling him to go. He wants him to be with his wife. Why? So he can cover up for the action that happened. But Uriah fell asleep. He didn't go in and he didn't sleep with his wife Bathsheba. David was told Uriah did not go home. So he asked Uriah, haven't you just come from a military campaign? Why didn't you go home? Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah are staying in tents, and my commander Joab and my lord's men are camped in the open country. How could I go to my house to eat and drink and make love to my wife? As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. Here's a man saying that I won't go home and to my wife knowing that my fellow um, soldiers is here camping out and enduring hardship, so I'm going to stay with them. How can I go home and enjoy food and drink when they are, are, are sitting in this condition? Such an honorable man, right? Such an honorable man. While David supposedly is sleeping with his wife while he's out in military campaign. Uriah said to David, I'm sorry, um, then David said to him, Stay here one more day, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day, and the next, at David's invitation, he ate and he drank with him. And David made him drunk. But in the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on his mat among with, uh, uh, I'm sorry. Uriah went out to sleep on his mat among his master's servants. He did not go home again. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it to Uriah. And in it, he wrote, put Uriah out in front of where the fighting is fiercest. Then withdraw him, so he will be struck down and die. So while Joab had the city under siege, he put Uriah at a place 
where he knew the strongest defenders were. When the men of the city came out and fought against Joab, some of the men in David's army fell. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite had died. Joab sent David a full account of the battle. He instructed the messenger, when you have finished giving the king this account of the battle, the king's anger may flare up. And he may ask you, why did you get so close to the city to fight? Didn't you know they would shoot arrows from the wall? Who killed Abimelech, son of Jerob, Besheth? Didn't a woman drop an upper milestone on him from the wall so that he died in the best? Why did you get so close to the wall? If he asks you this, then say to him, Moreover, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead. So basically, to appease David, let him know that Uriah is dead. End of story. And this goes on and on and on. It becomes very lengthy. But the gist we understand. David, who was a prophet, according to the Bible, seen a man's wife, an army soldier, who was out in battle, fighting for the country, fighting for David. He seen his wife taking a bath while he was perusing on his palace rooftop. And he desired her and lusted after her. And he sent for her. And he had sex with her. And he impregnated her. And then when he found out that she was pregnant, he concocted a story to get this man to go sleep with his wife so he can cover it up. And that this child would be attributed to this man. When the man didn't go home and sleep with his wife, in order to hide this affair that happened, David had this man put on the front line. And killed and murdered to hide his relationship and action with this woman illegally. This, according to the Bible, is King David. The ancestor of who? Jesus. On whose, Je on whose throne De Jesus is, is reigning over. A prophet, according to the Bible. We ask in closing, David Wood, Sam Shimon, would this action... Of David, according to the testimony in the Bible, be enough to disqualify David as a prophet of God? Will such a story be fitting to be considered the word of God? This is what we want to ask you. We dealt with your issue about the prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We refuted it and explained it. There's nothing there to discuss other than your own attempts to try to deflect your problems in your own book onto the prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But it's clear in your book what happened. Would this be enough to warrant a disqualification of David being a prophet according to your Bible? And if it is, then how does this affect your theology going later? How? And if you say that, no, it doesn't disqualify David as being a prophet, then how in your hypocrisy could you try to try disqualify the prophet Muhammad, peace upon him, as being a prophet for legally marrying and lawfully marrying a, a divorced woman who was divorced and legally divorced? How would you make that conclusion about the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, but not the same conclusion about David according to your own testimony. This is what we wanted to bring. Um, we hope that this is enough to um, bring this argument to a close. And we challenge our Christian friends to deal not with the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and his story and this issue about Zainab and the marriage because this marriage was a lawful, clean marriage. Legally. There was no foul play in it. One man divorced his wife. Another man married a divorced wife or divorced woman. There's no big deal in that other than the cultural superstition that they had against adopted sons and marrying the ex-wives. Islam eradicated that for many reasons, along with other things it eradicated that was superstition according to the pre-Islamic um, pagan culture, Arab culture. That's it. But how about this story? How about this sensationalism, this, this, this love story of this man seeing this woman on the rooftop bathing and sitting for her and having sex with her and impregnating her and then sending her husband to get killed in battle to justify and warrant that. And later on, this woman became the wife of David. SubhanAllah. Again, Muslims, we don't believe this story is true. This is not our understanding of um, the life of Prophet uh, David, alayhi salam.
but this is according to the Bible, and they have to deal with that. Hada wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa alihi wa sallam. Subhanaka la humba bihamdika. Ashadu wa la ilal ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu alaik. Wa salamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Be sure to stay tuned to the following videos to complete this series. And we hope you enjoyed it and continue to enjoy. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.